It's my distinct pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, two fabulous uh, novelists and also both journalists. Um, I uh, have here with me on my left side Somnat Batabail and on my right side Tabish Kher. Uh, but um, he was so brilliant to tell me to pronounce it in the local recognition, in the local uh, audio recognition. So it would be Tabish Kair when you, you know, go and want to find the book. Um, yeah, so uh, we were thinking of having um, two brief readings. Uh, each author will present their work um, briefly, then I will have... Um, a short conversation, um, first with uh, uh, Somnat Batabail and then with Tabish uh, Kher, and then um, I hope we have an, um, a fruitful conversation, the three of us, and of course you have uh, always the opportunity to join us in the uh, conversation here. Yeah, um, Somnat uh, Barapail to my left here um, um, is presenting us today with his debut novel, uh, The Price You Pay. Um, Somnat uh, was uh, a journalist for more than 10 years um, and also as a practitioner, he also works academically um, on the topics and context of media. So his book is uh, very much informed by that and based on empirical research. So I think we will have a chance also to talk about that in a second. Um, he's also working on his second novel right now, which spans um, some of the topics um, of the price you pay uh, in a larger global perspective. Um, it will be also located to London, which might be an interesting uh, um, aspect and reference also to Tabish's work, so I'm very excited about uh, discussing that later. And um, Somnat Badapayo um, is living in uh, London and teaches uh, at the School of Oriental and African Studies. So please help me to welcome Somnat Badapayo. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks very much for having me here. This podium seems to move away. Just here, yeah. all right. Uh, I'm going to do a few readings, but before that, let me just introduce the novel briefly. The Price You Pay um, was my first novel, and it's based in Delhi. I was obsessed with the city once I left Delhi. Uh, so for 10 years, I'd been thinking about my time there. And um, this book, wants to see the Delhi, the Delhi that you know about, Delhi which is taken, uh, you know, its name taken the same breath with New York, London, Bombay, and other major global cities. But like all major cities, there's also an older Delhi which lurks within this globalized uh, world of finance, media, um, ethnicities, and the conflict which happens when the old world meets the new. And I explore this conflict through a crime reporter and his movements. Um, he works in the newspaper in the beginning, he moves into television, that kind of represents different kind of media forms. There are policemen, there are kidnappers, there are um, uh, sexy women who go and kidnap others, so loads of crime and stuff happen. But the main story which I wanted to tell was the conflict between the old and the new Delhi. Um, uh, so I will try and uh, read a few short sections which enumerate this um, quandrum, conundrum rather. Uh, and I'll also try and talk about the specificities of crime in Delhi, which Tabish knows well. He has been a crime reporter too. So the first section goes like this. In 1982, when Delhi was preparing to host the Asian Games, workers from across the country and beyond its borders had swarmed to the city to meet the construction demands. After a week or two of national euphoria and pride, the athletes left. The event was declared a success by the state. The officials packed their bags, 
the guests and spectators returned home, and the everyday business of the city resumed. But there were many who could not go back. The invisible workers stayed on, tackling different hurdles and running other races, building their uncertain lives on the banks of a moribund river not very far from the newspaper offices. Known as Yamuna Pushta, a shanty town grew, housing at its peak over 100,000 people. 30 years later, another sporting event, the Commonwealth Games, displaced them. A six-lane expressway and multi-story buildings now stood like forgotten memorials to the tin and tarpaulin shacks and the kachar roads. What took three decades to build vanished in four years of bulldozing, authorized by, a new, by numerous courts and choreographed by a powerful state. The evicted residents of the Yamuna Pushta scattered to the city's outskirts. Shorn of a protective community, raucous neighbors, the mindful eyes of uncles and aunts, and robbed of livelihoods, the poor became poorer. Petty thieves became criminals, and criminals aspired to be gangsters. Matera was born in the Pushta and lived there for 25 years with his parents and six siblings before their exile to the eastern stretches of the city in a wretched dark room where his mother cursed all day and cried through the night. But he wasn't the sort of young man to be deterred by a bit of bad kismet or gov government brutality. His last eight years of work, from running errands to enforcing orders and acting as part-time strongman, had finally resulted in a promotion. He and two associates were now in charge of daily operations at the Satta, the betting center at Kuchachalan in Chandni Chowk. It was a business hub of gambling in the city, and Salim Khan, the boss, dropped by regularly. Matera's hard work was being noticed. For this small-time crook, things were starting to happen. So this is the young Matera, a very small-time criminal. Um, I, when I write, and when I was a crime reporter, I was never interested in the big crimes and the big murders. I always got fascinated with the petty thieves, the small-time crook. Um, I'll tell you a very small incident as I go on. You know, um, a very rich woman uh, in Chandni Chowk, uh, which is the hub of old Delhi, central Delhi, had her jewelry snatched one evening, and I was at the police station working with my local sources, and she came in very agitated, and uh, the local constable had to count out to her because she was the wife of somebody important, and um, constables went out, caught all the thieves in the area, brought them in. Now, when that happens, thieves and their livelihoods get interrupted, parents get interrupted, sons get interrupted. Finally, we found out that the ornaments were fake. She disrupted 14 families for a long while just to get back things which were not worth more than a few, pen a few euros. You know, so these were the kind of things I started to get involved in as I started writing this book. Um, I will uh, re um, read another section. We have time, just tell me when, whenever we are getting in. Um, this section is um, when this young reporter, the protagonist of my novel, meets with the police commissioner. Now, he has, this is by far quite into the book. He has been doing some very good stories. And the way the state tries to control reporters is by bringing them into the fold. You know, you're all academics here. You know Gramsci and Hegemony. You bring them into the fold, the errant things, and all becomes part of the dialogue. So he has been invited for lunch. Tabish would know this well. You know, we used to go and meet our commissioners. Uh, so the commissioner, VN Pratap, is chatting with this guy and trying to describe the, what kind of a city Delhi is. We must ask ourselves what kind of society we are policing, mustn't we? Commissioner Pratap said to Abhishek, Abhishek is a reporter, who nodded between mouthfuls of chicken biryani. Let me tell you what happened the other day, which really made me wonder if I am the right person to head this force. Pratap helped himself to some soup. Gruesome incident in Mayur Vihar. You stay there, don't you? This man, posing as a courier, rings the doorbell of a third floor apartment. It's mid-afternoon. The husband has left for work. 
And this is a true story. The maid has come and gone. Mother is giving her nine-month-old daughter a bath. She opens the door to a man who shoves her inside. He has a knife with him. He ties the woman to a chair, then takes his time going through the cupboards, the safe. He takes the jewelry, takes the cash. And after about half an hour, he's ready to leave. Suddenly, the infant starts to cry, and he notices her. She's still in the tub. Maybe the water's got cold. She's wearing these thin gold earrings. He tries to rip them off her ears. The baby screams, and the man drowns her in the tub of water. Right there in front of her mother, for a pair of earrings, he takes a life. Pratap paused and looked at his, at his lunch companion, who had stopped eating. Now tell me, how do I police this society? What kind of a man is this? I police human beings. Is he human? If we are to police animals, do I have to become an animal too? Abhishek reached for his notepad. No, no, this is not for a story. I'm asking your opinion. Tell me what you think. Abhishek answered slowly, I don't know, sir. I wish I did. In the last one month, I've seen more things than in my entire life. I have no opinion. Right now, I think I'm just observing. Yes, the commissioner said kindly. It must have been quite a month for you. I'm glad that you say you're, you are observing. When you start having opinions, you can write editorials. He chuckled. You know, editors and senior police officers are much the same. We have opinions. We don't go out on the streets anymore. It's you guys, the reporters, the younger policemen, my constables, who are our eyes and ears. We need your curiosity. Abhishek was enjoying the lunch but did not forget work. He asked the commissioner to explain the rise in kidnappings in Delhi. I don't know. Perhaps it's the influx of migrants, Pratap said after a thoughtful pause. People come here from all over the country in search of a better life. In the villages, in the small towns, everyone knew each other. They had an identity, right? You were the tailor's son, somebody was the cobbler, barber, whatever. Here, who knows you? No one. There's a feeling of having been set loose. People can do anything, and they do. They kidnap, kill, rape. Are you, are you saying rising migration to the cities is a problem? No, I'm not saying that, the cop replied quickly. The home minister would kill me if I said that, given his plans for a 50% urban India. I know that's the worldwide trend, but here it'll wreck, it'll wreak, ha wreak havoc, Abhishek. The entire social fabric of this country is being changed. Suddenly, some people have got very rich. Others want it too, and will stop at nothing to get it. He paused. Look, I can't give you a quote on this. Ask Uday. He has all the quotes in the world. I'll stop here for now. Yeah? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samnat. Um, yeah, um, you already read some of the passages which shows very much um, how you uh, connect different discourses and topics um, from uh, urban contemporary India right now. So um, investigative journalism, but also the, the crook way of it um, and the entanglement with, with police um, covering up uh, uh, and of course corruption plays a huge role in, in your uh, novel. So I wonder, um, of course there is an easy way to say it is all about crime, but does this genre as cry in crime fiction helps you here? Do you think there is an advantage of using this, this uh, uh, genre to uh, not only um, point to these uh, aspects of uh, a certain discourses in, in, um, uh, uh, in, in a society, but also to rephrase the notion of truth, to be in a way of an, you know, ha does, does uh, crime literature has an, um, the potential of intervention? Um, I think I'm the wrong per person to answer this, but I'll try. Um, I mean, I, because I do not write to the genre of crime fiction as such. I didn't start to write a crime story. Um, crime, because crime fiction has a certain code, certain um, ways of writing, which is, uh, which is necessary to be followed. There has to be a murder, there has to be investigation, detection, um, which my book doesn't have. What I wanted to do, and, but I agree with you that crime throws a very different perspective on a city. Um, 
I came to Delhi from a very small town in India. Um, and as a student, um, and that's a way of looking at Delhi. But as a crime reporter for many years, I saw the city of Delhi through a very different lens, through the lens of good guys, bad guys, very easily done, policemen and how they look at a city. I got to know a city by districts, by crime statistics. Um, so I knew that the East Delhi murder means five centimeters of space, but a South Delhi murder will mean a front page cover. So you, know, so you look at the city very differently. So this is what I wanted to bring in when I examined Delhi and when I tried to look at Delhi, this, this perspective, which is um, you're both part of the state because you, you are very close to the police, the policemen, you're, they are your sources. You're also very close to the underworld belly, you know, um, the criminals, the, the, the petty and the big criminals. Um, so, you, so this is the perspective I wanted to bring in and, and try and examine a city which seems to be affluent, doing well, rising up the charts, you know, more, more, more and more money coming in. What happens? Yeah, yeah. So that sounds to me like um, really putting more emphasis and giving voice to exactly the parts which do not make the headlines, which do not make also the front pages, mm. but also in the in the sense to put that in negotiation with the ones which make the headlines. So, yes, true. You're yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, so in 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 this context, who would you say? Um, is your, is, is your writing for? Who do you want to um, read your stories and reflect on, in a different way, crime literature? Uh, it's a difficult one. Um, I, I, I mean, I think many writers take this differently. I, I very consciously do not have an imagined audience. I do not write for anyone but for myself. I, this is, I mean, I have a story to tell, and I try and tell the story as honestly as possible. And if I'm satisfied, then the story works uh, for me. Uh, having said it, I was not satisfied with the price you paid. I realized only after you write the first book that no writer is ever satisfied. At one point, you just have to say, you know what? I have to let it go. I've taken the advance. My editor is on my head. I have a, uh, I have a day job. Uh, but having said it, um, uh, and, and, and perhaps it's a problem that you should imagine an audience. You, know, you should think about who is going to read you. Uh, and, and, in a, and in a cynical way, you know. You know it's the English-speaking public. It, you're obviously, you, know, you, 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 you write to a certain criteria. But um, I fear that if I would think that I'm writing for a certain section, I would tailor my work towards that, which I did not want to do. Okay. But can you, well, fair enough, absolutely. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit how it, it was perceived, your work? You said you are not satisfied, of course, that I, okay, I can only take that as a motivator for your, for your next writing, so that's actually good for us. But in a sense of, is it uh, you know, perceived differently in the UK or in India? Well, um, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess it has been, uh, the second edition came out within four months, so it perhaps has done well. Uh, and... Um, uh, I've got the advance for the next book, so, so those are the good things. Um, also, uh, so if I mean, and, um, the press has been fairly okay with it, though I wrote about journalists and their crooked ways. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I'm glad about how the re reception has been. If you, that's the question you are asking, um, am, am I answering the right uh, mm -hmm. question? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, your answer also, of course, right. <laughs> it's your, it's your answer. Uh -huh. um, um, I feel like the, uh, you're referring now to the uh, public in, in the UK. Mm. Um, can you say a little bit how it is perceived in India? Is it um, published there, discussed, reviewed? Yeah, well, I mean, the Indian literary scene has changed so much in the last 10 years, that which will tell you the same, that you know, there's a profusion of uh, literary festivals, world writers name them, they have all been there. So we are part of this huge literary circle. And I say that with a lot of caution, because it's also very incestuous and small at the same time. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, when the book comes out, you're invited to 20 uh, literary festivals. Um, the, and you become part of a sudden celebrity cult, which you are very, which you never knew that you, know, you, you were part of. Uh, and um, 
But the problem is that good literary cr critique and criticism doesn't exist. You know, despite the number of magazines and newspapers, uh, you have interviews with ask you what kind of clothes you are and what food do you want to eat? And uh, do you like the, you know, in Delhi, what's your favorite food joint? So that's another problem. Um, but uh, having said that, there is, there is a bigger market. Uh, it's an immature market, I think. But you know, it's something which will need and take time. But there's, all the big publishing houses are there. Sadly, the independent publishing houses find it very difficult to compete. Um, but there is a space for a conversation. And I think it will grow in the next few years, become more mature. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, um, uh, uh, move on uh, to uh, Tabish and then, of course, yes. um, uh, come back with you uh, into the discussion a little bit later. So uh, let me introduce um, our next writer um, to my right here, uh, Tabish Kher um, Kair. You can find his books uh, there in front as well. Uh, the things uh, we'll read and uh, present uh, from the things about thugs, but also uh, brought us another one, how to fight Islamic terror from the missionary position. So I'm very excited to hear about that. Um, Tabish was born and educated in a small town in India and is a critically acclaimed author and poet whose re uh, recent novels have been shortlisted for the Anchor Award in the UK and the Crossword Prize in India. Um, he has won the All India Poetry Prize and his novels have been shortlisted for various uh, major awards and been also translated in several uh, other languages. Um, the Things About Thugs uh, was also shortlisted for the Men in um, Asian Literary Prize in 2010. Um, and uh, he is presently working um, in Denmark and, and teaching at the university um, at our house. Um, um, he worked also as a journalist in India, um, as we already heard, in the 1990s, and still also contributes to refuse, uh, with refuse and articles to major papers in India and abroad. So please help me to welcome Tabish Khair. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, lovely to be here. Uh, I was intending to read from the thing about tax, which is my contribution to what is sometimes called crime fiction. Uh, unfortunately, copies of this novel are not available for sale. On the other hand, copies of my fourth novel, the one I wrote after the things about tax, are available for sale, <laughs> which is why I'll read from How to Fight Islamist Terror from the Missionary Position, uh, which is a kind of... Uh, crime novel in the sense that it plays on expectations of crime. Uh, the thing about Tux is a neo-Victorian crime thriller that plays with the genre that, that talks about certain racial prejudices and pseudo-scientific uh, uh, tendencies in the late and the mid-19th century uh, and constructs a story of crime that takes place in London, uh, but is solved not by a Sherlock Holmes kind of very European dick detective who uses his intellect and stays aloof from everything and solves everything using reason. But a very different kind of detective, an ayah, a nurse taken from India to England, lots of women were, uh, who uses a different kind of thinking to solve the crime. Uh, we'll probably talk about this novel. Uh, how to Fight Islamist Terror from the Missionary Position was the novel I wrote after The Thing About Tux. And this is about uh, expectations of terror, uh, threats of terror in the contemporary world. Uh, it's the only novel that I've set in Denmark. It's narrated by a young Pakistani academic who moves in with his friend, a very privileged, a very sharp, uh, kind of maverick, uh, caustic observer of human nature, Hindu from India. Uh, both of them are from the same, uh, uh, from the same uh, uh, English uh, medium background. And their landlord is a very religious, uh, lower middle class Indian taxi driver. And slowly they start suspecting that this taxi driver is, is involved in some kind of terrorist activity. However, the extract I'll read out is 
from the beginning of the novel when the, where the two men are dating. Uh, the unnamed narrator uh, has just been divorced and Ravi, the perennial bachelor, a bit of a charmer. They, are, they have gone to a cafe called On a Mask and Under the Mask, uh, where they're supposed to meet their dates. It was a Thursday evening, and On a Mask and was already crowded when we got there. We still had half an hour to kill before our twin dates arrived. We managed to get a corner table under the usual assortment of masks and trinkets. A huge aquarium lined the wall behind us. Ravi lit a cigarette. I had smoked occasionally at parties or on nights out, but Ravi had started smoking just a couple of years back when his smoking was banned in public places in Denmark. He claimed the ban was proof of the sexist and anti-working class turn of Denmark in recent years, for it was mostly women and working class men who still smoked. He decided to oppose it by smoking at least one cigarette per day, and so far he had steadfastly adhered to his sole silent smoking protest against the ruling powers of Denmark. He offered me a cigarette from his packet of Marlboro, I declined. A rare smoker, I did not feel that the cigarette fog in the pub required any further contribution from me. The women who entered within a minute of each other did not look very different from their photos on the dating site. That was a relief. They also appeared to be able to identify us easily, though of course any two South Asians in any bar in Aarhus could not be too difficult to locate. Introductions over, drinks fetched by Ravi the Generous, our conversation hesitated and hiccuped like an antique car, then it rolled down the kind of incline that I had become familiar with over the past few months of internet dating in Denmark. The initial weeks had been a surprise, though I had been forewarned about Ravi, who had been religiously dating on the internet and elsewhere since his arrival in Denmark, between us, he liked to point out, we had experience of dating in five countries, India, Pakistan, though Ravi had reservations about the existence of real dating in that country, England, USA, and Switzerland. Switzerland, USA, where he had spent various periods as a student or journalist, were Ravi's contribution to the list, as was India. But Denmark, Ravi claimed, was different. It was perhaps the only country left in the Western Hemisphere where 80% of all women were afraid of dating a colored man, and all but 1% of the rest would only date colored men if they had a chance. A bit like England in the 1950s, this progressive country is a few decades behind the rest in some areas, Ravi insisted. At first inclined to dismiss this as predictable rhetoric over Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip this a bit, then the two girls arrive, and uh, they start talking. Um, Ravi's date, after establishing her credentials with Ravi by criticizing the Danish People's Party and its anti-immigrant politics, had proceeded, a bit surprisingly, to launch into a detailed analysis of last night's handball semi-final between Denmark and Spain, which Denmark had won after trailing in the first quarter. I knew Ravi must be squirming in the depths of his casually clad soul, as he had no interest whatsoever in any ball game. Ravi was of the opinion that the West's fascination with ball games, sadly being communicated to the rest, was susceptible to Freudian analysis and not necessarily from the angle of the Oedipus complex. When my platinum blonde, after mentioning her love for Tolkien, which was perhaps evoked by the fact glaringly mentioned in my dating profile that I loved, read, and taught, but did not write literature, proceeded to tell me how she never dated Danish men who were always so incredibly boring I knocked Ravi's knee three times with my knee. This was one of our established signals. There was a pause. Then he tapped back three times. 
he had agreed. Two minutes later, I excused myself, went to the dingy little poster-ridden toilet on the other side of the bar, and called Ravi on his mobile. He answered with alacrity. I mumbled a 1960s Bombay film song into the receiver. He replied gobbledygook in Hindi, with a few suitably intonated English words, especially hospital, 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 thrown in. When I returned from the toilet, Ravi had bad news for me. Our cousin had called. Another cousin had been hit by a car. Oh no, I said. We had to meet both the cousins at a hospital where the first cousin was rushing the second cousin. Our dates looked suitably concerned. There were nice Danish girls with nice Danish hearts. We looked suitably disappointed. We knew from experience that the fact that Ravi and I did not resemble each other in any way would not be noticeable to them. It seldom is to most people in Denmark. Families, said Ravi, the dramatist, unable to resist the temptation to improvise. That's what happens when you have large extended families. The girls nodded in sympathy. They read the newspapers and knew all about immigrants with their large families, all of them crammed into little Denmark. Some other time, I'm sure, I said, pulling Ravi away before he over-improvised. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tavish. Yeah. Um, so you read from your second book, um, but also uh, we want to talk about um, your, your, your first book. And it seems that topics um, are intercepting here, of course, um, in the sense of um, how to make yourself comprehensible, it looks to me, that um, in to, um, uh, 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 to tell stories about migration, migrant uh, contributions, and, and also negotiations of uh, their own lives and histories um, in uh, a new setting. Um, yeah, so I would also want to ask you uh, to what extent um, the genre of crime literature would help you in um, ne negotiating and telling these stories. I think it's already on. Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, well, as you noted, uh, there, there, there's a certain overlap. I'm interested in how people uh, react to each other. I'm interested in people's prejudices uh, on all sides, uh, the host uh, population as well as the migrating population, and I like to play with those things. Uh, um, I didn't really set out, like, like Somnath, I didn't set out to write a crime novel. Uh, the thing about Tug, uh, that, that genre just fitted in. I wanted to say certain things, and that genre I could play with. I could play with, with also the reader's expectations from the genre, which for me is very interesting, very, very, very important to do. Uh, and uh, again, in, in How to Fight Islamist Terror from the Missionary Position, again, I play with certain expectations that we have when we think of terror, or we think of, uh, of, of, of any kind of threat along those lines. So, so those were the things that actually led me into the genre. Yes. Yeah, I, I like that a lot, uh, how you say, you know, the, the reader's expectations with the genre, you know, I think that's a, it's, that's a huge part of it. So um, I feel like, especially in um, uh, uh, the thing about thugs, that you um, kind of disturb this, this expectation and also um, taking readers out of their comfort zone in a sense of to know what I know or to know what it is actually supposed to be, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of how knowledge, how evidence actually comes, you know, comes to living, and you kind of disturb that, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I would agree with that. At least that's what I set out to do it in different ways than all my novels. I mean, uh, I've written four novels that are available internationally. My fifth novel will come out uh, uh, just under the Jihadi Jain uh, in about one month. Uh, and uh, and in all, all, the, all the five novels are quite different from one another, stylistically, in their generic affinity, and so on and so forth. Um, the voices of the narrators. Uh, but uh, they do share this concern, uh, which has partly to do with uh, social elements, how we relate to each other. But to me, it also has to do with language. Because language is not something that exists on its own for me. 
Okay? Language is out there. Language is not just as uh, politicians want us to think, a medium of communication. Of course, it enables communication, but it's also something that prevents communication <laughs> at the same time. It's not just something that enables you to connect. It's also a weapon that you can use other against other people, which means that uh, every time you use language creatively, you have to work with the possibilities that are available to you, but also what is perhaps being denied. To what extent can you push that language a bit farther? That's what I try to do. <laughs> And that's, of course, a lot of intersection with both of your works. I mean, not just from the perspective you're both working from as, you know, the journalistic... Oh, I, I will change with you. That's easy. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, from the lens of the journalist and the investigative journalism. Um, so I want to uh, bring back in uh, Somnat and um, ask, you know, how, how do you think that, you know, the, the, the topics you are interested in um, the narratives you tell, you know, kind of relate uh, to what we just heard from Tabi. I mean, I think both Tabish and I um, uh, come from a, I mean, our, our training in, in, in journalism, um, kind of, and I'm sorry I'm speaking for you if I am, and do forgive me, um, gives you a certain kind of lens. You know, you look at things in a particular way over a long period of time when you do the same thing again and again, like just coverage of crime, the routinization of crime, the desensitization about, about crime. Um, and when you move away from it for a long time, like I have and like Tabesh has, uh, it allows you to reflect on how you have done things, why you have done certain things in a certain way. I mean, I've, I found it quite difficult, especially, um, you know, one of the things which I had to do was look at myself in a very critical fashion as a media scholar. So I had to turn the lens on myself first. For over six years, seven years, I did that. And then the novel came. Once I did that and saw, my God, that's what we used to do. There's a collusion with the state. You know, journalists and state has to collude to produce, and this is not only in India. You take it in any country, your official sources, and without whom journalism cannot be practiced, is the state. And so therefore, imagine, um, how we work. So that, once that realization came, and, and um, I felt that there was a novel there, that there was a story there, um, and, and therefore the lens was um, journalism and crime and city and its um, politics. Yeah. And, and as Tabish, uh, Tabish was saying, you know, um, uh, language becomes very important. You know, a, a crime reporter's language is very important. It's, it's, um, when you become a journalist, um, or when you, when you start writing, you, you, there's nothing new you do. You're schooled into an older paradigm. People tell you how to write, who, what, when, why. It's an old paradigm. You just fit into it. That's the language you use. Only once you step out do you, can you examine that. Thank you so much. I think that is a great also invitation um, to discuss both of your works in a, in a larger context and related to each other to invite uh, the audience to pose questions and also commentaries. So please indicate if you want to be included here. Yeah, Al Nason, please. I was just going to ask, do you find the genre crime fiction limiting in some sense, especially to some of us who write literary fiction or claim we write literary fiction, there's sort of a snobbishness. We kind of push our noses up at people who write crime, like those crime people. You know, they fill up the spaces during summer while they're waiting for the serious reads, you know, that we are going to write. Do you feel any of that? May I take that first? Okay. Well, uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer it uh, in a slightly, perhaps slightly academic way. Uh, I, I, I have lots of problems with the definition literary fiction, genre fiction, and so on and so forth. Uh, I have tried to, to, to intervene in the discussion. And I, I, one of the ways I look at pulp fiction is if there's something called pulp fiction, which is not the same as genre fiction or literary fiction, 
a pulp fiction is fiction that repeats what it is doing time and again. Okay? And in that sense, I would say that a lot of literary fiction is pulp fiction. Okay? Okay? Uh, but a lot of genre fiction is not pulp fiction when it goes beyond, like someone like Raymond Chandler or so on and so forth. You take, they take genre feature, features and you use them creatively, you get out of writing pulp fiction. You stick to literary features of a literary novel, you write pulp fiction as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that, that would be my position there. So you can use genre fe features creatively and that can open up a space for you. Uh, uh, just as you can be confined to features of literary novels, and that can actually confine you too. <laughs> so Tabish just gave you the academic answer. <laughs> I'll give you the lay, lay person, the first time writer's answer. So my publisher came and uh, I, I said, hey, this is not a crime novel. You know, this is literary fiction, dude. Uh, and um, she said, well, look, do you want a second edition out in six months? I said, yes. Make it a crime thriller. Let me market it as a crime thriller, you'll sell more. So that's the answer to you literary fiction people. We sell more. <laughs> well, I, 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 may I add to that? Uh, just because this brings to mind, uh, this, this edition was, was, was kind of marketed as crime fiction too, neo-Victorian, and published by Horton Mifflin, Big American House. So then I wrote my next novel, and my agent contacted them and said, well, they said, yeah, sure, sure. So it, what is it about? And my agent ex described this novel, and they said, oh, but we thought he was writing another new Victorian crime thriller. So no, we don't want to read this novel. Ask him to write another new Victorian crime thriller. <laughs> That's what our market is prepared for now. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Of course, can I get some power on that one All right, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, of course, that are marketing aspects, which, of course, it's always the, the, the market pushes and, and points in the direction. But I wonder if there are also some, you know, some more, maybe deeper thoughts about and um, ideas what crime, uh, crime fiction as a genre can can be, you know, of an advantage or can can help us to understand. And I mean, as both of you writing, um, especially giving voice to um, marginalized um, or, uh, or, so to speak, unauthorized sources, you know, taking up from some that what you just said in, you know, with the reference of what are our official source sources as a state. So actually showing and unearthing these stories and giving voice and, and uh, um, the few to these unauthorized sources, unauthorized narratives. Hmm? Um, that may, you know, gives me immediately academically thinking of uh, Spivak you know, in, a, in a certain extent. So I wonder, and I would want to pose this question to both of you, and don't, don't be afraid, uh, nothing too complicated post-colonial, but a little bit as well, of course. Um, what do you think can we learn here in Europe by you, know, you negotiating these topics in this uh, um, uh, genre of crime literature? Can we learn something about the notion of crime and not in the um, yeah, uh, very simplistic form of now I think I know what crime is in India. I mean, that is really not where I want to go th there. But in the sense of since you are uh, negotiating a lot of um, uh, uh, identity and uh, um, uh, narratives of history um, within the context of migration and certainly also with regard to Europe, you are just writing about a huge uh, uh, globalized narrative here. So my, my, my question would be, what about here? Can we learn something? I mean, of course we can, but what should we learn about crime in relation you know, to the globalized uh, uh, topics right now? Gosh, it's such a huge question, um, yeah, and, and you also, you've also you know, mentioned the dreaded lady, uh, Spivak, uh, yes. so uh, <laughs> one has got to be. So, um, I think I'll go back to what you were saying before. Uh, the, the very act of writing um, and the, the attempt to puncture the single story narratives mm -hmm. of the non-West, uh, of the global South, uh, I think um, uh, just the, the fact that we are out there, that we, you know, India is not 
the most corrupt place in the world. The, it's corrupt in many ways. Uh, so, you know, just an over, overarching notion of corruption doesn't do any justice. How are we corrupt? Why are we corrupt? Why are things falling apart? What is the, what is the um, responsibility of the colonial countries and what have they left behind, the legacies? You know, all of these things come in. And in a sense, you're right, in the broader context of crime, and I, I think crime fiction, just by saying crime fiction, we fall into a trap, um, uh, can, in a sense, examine all of these conversations. I mean, look at how generally mainstream Western media understands the global south. You know, it's, it's, a, it's something, and the po uh, when we say that we just say stories, I do not completely agree with Nathan, in the sense that we're always saying a story against something. There's no way I can not have the context of what you have said about us, mm -hmm. um, how you have said it. Um, the, um, my act of storytelling is also in this vast cam canvas of being painted as a certain kind of subject. Yes. And, yeah, thank uh, you so much. Yeah. If, if I may take up from there. Uh, and, and, I mean, I don't see myself as representing people, but I see myself as telling a story that I feel have not been told. I've seen gaps because, because of perhaps my own trajectory. And the thing about tax, for instance, uh, grew out of academic research that I was doing or for a book on Gothic fiction. Uh, and, uh, and I started reading about Tuggy in the 19th century, we realized that there was a great discrepancy between what the British claimed that the Tuggy cult was about and what the Tugs themselves said in police accounts recorded by the British. For the British, it was a cult that was passed on from father to son. But the Tugs themselves recorded by the British almost, over, almost always had stories like, oh, my father was a farmer, then we lost the field, so I joined this cult. I said, there's a discrepancy here. So there are stories in that gap. And that's how that novel came out, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, um, you're just referring also to the to the gap, to the uh, 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 void of of narratives and what it means, you know, if the story is being told um, from from the victor or the ones, you know, who usually write history. And you already addressed that in your question to El Nathan uh, Jimamanda Adichie, who reminded of us uh, the. Uh, a danger of this single story to be uh, uh, told. So I think that is um, not an academic, but a very critical intervention, what you're also uh, pointing us to, what crime literature can do to actually to to give uh, voice to this, this, this voids and to actually picture um, and bring back uh, aspects of history um, which are usually being written out. So I want to encourage all of you to just read more crime literature and especially read both of our authors here. And uh, please help me to thank them once again.